Welcome to Close Horse, the podcast that is very excited to say that this week marks one year since Hutch decided to move in with Dustin and me. And no, Hutch isn't a child we adopted or a relative or our new polyamorous partner. Uh, Hutch is a cat. <laughs> and he's a humongous white fluffy cat who loves a big vet bill who wandered into our lives back when we were living in Burden Hand. And now he lives here in Texas and he is great. Um, I'm your host, Amanda, and this is not a podcast about cats, but this is episode 140. I mean, it's a little bit of podcast about cats, right? <laughs> anyway, today's special guest, I'm super excited about this guest, is Katya, the founder and editor of No Kill. No Kill magazine is about culture with a conscience and fashion for a future. According to their website, they go on to say, we believe in role models as models and ending the elevation of empty celebrity. Of course, you know, I love this. I have been a major fan of No Kill for quite some time, and I am just so happy to have a chance to get to know Katya. We are going to discuss why so many people will perform all sorts of mental acrobatics to explain why they need fast fashion. I know because I get DMs all the time that contain these mental acrobatics. I see them in the comments. I see them on all their posts. Y'all have seen them too, right? Did I just say y'all like a real Texan? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> we are also going to talk about how retail and warehouse workers are the domestic evidence of how the fashion and retail industries regard all of the workers all the humans who are responsible for those companies' profits. We're also going to talk about how pissed, for a lack of a better term, we are about the CFDA partnering with Amazon. When I learned this, I was, I had many feelings. You'll hear about them today. And Katya will share all of the reasons she is feeling optimistic about the future. And so am I. This conversation is what they call a long boy, and I couldn't find a place where it made sense to split it into a two-parter, so you won't be getting an introductory segment for me today like you normally do. But before we jump into this very long conversation, this very long and exciting conversation, if I may say so myself, I want to talk about something important to me, and that is supporting and fostering small business. If you've been hanging out around here long enough, then you know that I firmly believe that small business is the future. In fact, the future depends on smaller, more ethical businesses. Yes, not every small business is owned by a saint. Some owners are terrible bosses. They sell bad product or they just don't care about the communities around them. And if they are bad like that, you know, of course, skip them. But even the worst small businesses, they have significantly smaller impact than the big baddies like Amazon or some of my past employers. And the fact is, most small businesses are run by people you know, we know, and they are just trying to make a living while doing the best job they can. And I want us to support them. No matter how you feel about the winter holidays, which trust me, I have feelings too, it, it is an important time of year for small businesses. Last year, I started a few traditions around here for that holiday shopping season. For one, I featured audio essays from small business owners from our community in every episode of the podcast in November and December. And what was great is some of the people who submitted audio essays reached out to me later and said, wow, I met so many new people. I got new customers. I made new friends. And you know, that's that's what community is, right? So we're going to bring that back this year. Let's talk about what the audio essay is. It's a recording you make using either your phone or your computer. You email it to me at amanda at closehorse.world and I edit it and mix it, add it to an episode. It's not an ad, okay? If if you send me an essay that is basically just an ad, I'm gonna write back to you and ask you to judge it up a little bit. It's really supposed to be your story as a small business owner, your feelings about owning a small business, including what motivated you to start a small business? Why is it important to you and why do you do it? 
what have you learned, maybe sometimes the hard way. And of course, I want you to include information about your business and where listeners can find you. Write out what you're going to say before you record it. Seriously, it, trust me, I am a person who has experience in this, a lot of experience in this at this point. You are going to be much happier with your essay. You are going to remember to say everything you want to say if you write it out in advance and either use it as a reference or literally read it. But read it to me like I'm a kid at story time at the library, okay? (laughs) Uh, It's okay if you make a mistake while you're doing this. Don't you think I make one gazillion mistakes while I'm recording? Just keep going. Don't stop. Don't start over. Pick up where you made the mistake and keep rolling and I will edit it out. That's what I do with myself. I'm used to it. It's very easy. I don't even, I don't know. I don't even notice that I have to edit people's stuff out. I just hear it and I do it on sort of like, I don't know. It's just automatic, right? Record in a quiet room away from fans, air conditioners, bus stops, howling dogs, Yelling babies, you know all the things. Trust me, it makes a big difference. Be sure to double check your recording before sending. Listen, I know listening to your own voice is the worst. Why is it so terrible? I don't know. It was a huge hurdle that I had to overcome when I started making Close Horse because obviously I have to listen to all of this when I edit. Although I will tell you a lot of podcasters don't ever listen to their podcast. They don't edit it. And I do think it's part of that weird anguish we all get from hearing our own voice. But alas, I'm going to need you to listen to your recording before you send it to me. For one, yes, I have received fully silent recordings from people, meaning nothing, nothing is on it. I, it's just like a weird empty track. I bet it has something to do with someone's AirPods not pairing properly with their phone or something like that. So you want to make sure that's good. You also want to make sure that it sounds okay. Now, I'm not talking about like, does your voice sound okay? But like, is it clear what you're saying? Or is there a lot of interference like from outside noises? You want to make sure that that sounds good. Dustin, who is, you know, not only my partner, but also the audio engineer around here, he can judge it a little bit. But some some background noise is just too too difficult to overcome. You know, lawn mowers, leaf blowers, screaming, that kind of stuff. So you really want to just give it a listen and make sure you don't even need to listen to the whole thing if it's super painful to you. Just make sure it sounds good. Okay. Now that you've done all of that, now that I've given you this whole spiel about how to do it, I'm going to let you know that the deadline for this project is November 1st, and it is definitely a first come, first serve situation. So don't procrastinate. So that's the audio essays, but that wasn't enough for me. So I was like, what else could I do for the last few months of the year to support small businesses? And I decided that every week in November, I will be creating reels and carousels of my favorite small businesses. I've heard that a lot of people in the Instagram community love that when I do that. So I'm going to be doing that with just some of my favorite small businesses. I will be assembling highlights on my profile by gift category of even more businesses that you could support. And I'm hoping to host weekly Instagram live panel conversations with small businesses in our community, just talking about what they're working on, their feelings about the slow fashion movement, what they're doing to live a more sustainable lifestyle, and, you know, sharing their stories as small business owners. If you're interested in getting involved in any of those Instagram lives, please email me. Once again, that's amanda at closehorse.world. The email address is always in the show notes if you forget it. Um, Please do not DM me on Instagram. Well, for one, if you do that, I'm going to tell you to email me. So we're just like not even being efficient, right? And the reason it's really important to me that all those messages come via email is that I'm going to be really honest with all of you that my life is a whirling dervish of projects. I have my day job. I have close horse. I have volunteer work. I have small biz big pick, which is the small business class I teach. And a whole bunch of other stuff. And so I need to have all of my communication in one place, which in this case for me is email. That ensures that nothing falls through the cracks. I don't want to forget about you or not write back to you. And even more importantly, strangely enough, is that it really mitigates my anxiety so much, which is really important too. It helps keep me productive if I'm a little bit less anxious and feel like I'm on top of things. 
if you're listening to this and you're saying like, hey, I'm not actually a small business owner, but I would love to know how I can support small businesses. I mean, number one is obviously giving them your money, whether that's via purchases, gifts you buy for other people, gift cards, etc. But there are a lot of ways beyond spending any money that you can support small businesses too. One is, you know, recommend all of your favorite small businesses to your friends, family, etc. When someone asks you for your gift list, include items or gift certificates from those small businesses. Like, save, and share Instagram posts from your favorite makers, sellers, small brands, etc. Bonus points for commenting on posts and tagging friends. I think that's really great too. You know, it's really hard for small businesses to get in front of a lot of people because, you know, they can't afford to buy ads on Instagram and Frankly, the amount of money they'd have to spend to get stuff in front of a lot of people on Instagram is not money that they have, right? And lastly, something easy you can do is, and it gets kind of fun (laughs) in a weird way, is to write positive reviews for businesses you've already shopped, you know, on Yelp, on Google reviews, if you bought something on Etsy, all of that stuff. It's really hard to find these businesses because they're sort of hidden by so much other noise. And so it's up to us to kind of pull that noise aside and push people forward. All right. At the end of the day, we get to build the future that we want. And one piece of that puzzle involves breaking away from big unethical companies and shopping locally and small. Like what if, this is a dream, what if we saw Amazon go out of business in our lifetimes? I'm just saying it could happen, but it's not going to happen without all of us. Okay, we're definitely going to be talking about Amazon and a lot of other things in today's conversation. So let's just jump right in. Let's meet Katya. Why don't you get us started by introducing yourself to everyone? My name is Katya and I'm the editor and founder of No Kill Magazine. And that's a website that takes sort of the traditional fashion lifestyle website idea and kind of turns it on its head because we prioritize people and the planet. And what I mean by that is we look for uh, sustainable fashion, you know, ethical fashion, clean beauty, and more like role models than celebrities. I mean, I love that. So I was so excited when you reached out to me because I've been a big fan of No Kill. And I think, I don't know, it's like, I get why fashion is so glamorous and appealing to all of us because it is, it's such a a valuable art form and creative expression. But I think over the years, many years, I guess, like decades, it's, it's become this other thing that lacks the art, but certainly has a lot of artifice. And so I like, I like the refreshing, I know the real take on it. You mentioned sort of like, you know, the art of fashion. And that's one of the things that I'm hoping that No Kill still retains because when I started it, I was looking around or actually when I first kind of learned about sustainable fashion and why that's important, I would look at the websites and there was nothing that I felt like resonated with me. It all felt very Mm -hmm. mommy and beige and green. And (sighs) you could like fashion or you could like sustainability, but it kind of felt like if you like sustainability, you needed to sort of almost consider yourself above fashion in a way that I just completely disagree with. When I began making close horse, I looked out at the sort of landscape of other people who were talking about this, creating content around it. And it was really hard for me to see where I fit into that because I wasn't beige, right? right. Um, I don't wear a lot of like hemp clothing. I actually wear a lot of really bright like I'm, I have a very bold style. I'll just say that. And I've always loved the creativity, the creative expression that fashion gives us. I just hated everything else about it. And I felt like a lot of the content out there around sustainable fashion was very f- focused on like superiority and shaming mm-hmm. other people. And it had the same sort of like shopping focused exclusivity classist elements of mainstream fashion so like it just it was hard for me to see how people who are just like creative and care about things fit into it you know yes uh so i'm excited i'm always excited to see how much 
this world has expanded over the past few years in a weird way. I think the pandemic gave more and more people a chance to like think about these things and be activated by them and show that this is a very diverse community. This movement is more than just like really thin white yoga moms. Right. Right. I, I mean, know, like, I know. Who get their like Lululemon? Is that how? You, I don't even know if that's how you say it. Lulu. <laughs> I don't even know. Okay, I'm like Lulema. Um, but you know, their fancy yoga mat that's made out of this biodegradable blah blah blah. I'm like, that's that's not that that's not it. I mean, that's not only it. So so yeah. So when I started No Kill, I was um, I had wanted to do something in the sustainability space for a little while. Um, ever since really in 2015 when I saw The True Cost, which you know most of your listeners probably know the documentary about Rana Plaza. And then you kind mm-hmm. of have that like come to Jesus moment <laughs> with sustainable yeah. fashion, like, oh my God, I, I need to change my ways. Um, and I was happened to be also working for a sustainable fashion startup at the time. And so I was just kind of really learning so much that I didn't know. And so I when I decided, hey, I really want to make something, I was like, but I want it to appeal to people who love fashion first, not who are looking to be sustainable first, because Mm -hmm. those are the people whose minds we need to shift, really. I mean, my my mission is to fundamentally change the way we shop, which is huge. And and I'm not the only one who will be doing it, obviously, but (laughs) just me. Just me. I'll just-, just you. You're. It's all on you. Let me know when you're done. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, yeah. So I thought, like, well, I need to show people, you know, different options that are, you know, more affordable or different ways to do things or styling more. Or, um, looking at the big picture. And yeah, sometimes say why. You know, go deep dive into like why we need to do it. But more than that, to kind of have sort of like the celebratory place of look at all the amazing people who are doing amazing things and let's be excited about it. One of the things that I tell our um, small army of interns because this runs on a small army of interns <laughs> getting college credit, <laughs> not paid, but they do get college credit and okay, and significant mentoring. I know there's lots of issues about not being paid, but um, I am not Condé Nast. I do not have a Condé Nast budget. I have the budget of my <laughs> bank account. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. I mean, I would love an intern too. You're inspiring me. (laughs) (laughs) So the interns love interning with us, or at least they tell me that because that's what one, well, that's what one says when they're an intern. But I, I tell them one of my favorite things that I say is the future is a place we invent. (gasps) I love that. I I love it too. And I I can't take credit for it. I'm sure I saw it on Instagram somewhere, but it really... (laughs) But it, 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 it's proactive and it's not, yeah. it's not um, despairing or de- depressed. And, and I think we, as, like, as a society and, and you know, people in general, we always think you know, things are happening like, to us. Like, and, and it's true. The, the pandemic happened to us. Climate change is happening to us. You know, the, things are happening to us, but we have to envision the future with ourselves as like active participants. Mm-hmm. And, and so I think if you approach, you know, anything like that, but when I, you know, when I try to go like, what, what are articles we want to be writing for no kill? I try to think of it from that. Like, well, how do I want the future to be? Oh, I want people to be, you know, wearing regenerative fashion. Well, first they have to know what the hell it is. Then they have to know where to find it. So let, let's give them that. Let, let's explain why that's a cool thing, you know? So that's that's how I think of it. Yeah, no, I love that. I think showing people a future that they're a part of is really important. And I think that's why it's important for us to expand the, the scope of what it looks like to mm-hmm. live a sustainable lifestyle, right? Because for so long, what we think of as the so-called sustainable lifestyle, right, has been really dictated by brands, Right. that are selling us stuff often to a very specific group of people in a very specific aesthetic, right? Um, and then like the media that surrounds it. But it's always, it's like the same color palettes. It's the same 
often these clothes are not like well sized. If you want my honest opinion as a person who works in this industry, like the sizing is off, the sizing is not inclusive, the pricing is out of re range for a lot of people. Uh, aesthetically, it's very narrow. So if you don't see yourself as a person who wants to wear like a beige hemp tunic, then you are not part of it, right? Well, what's your problem and then? <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. And like, like I said, when I started, I making close horse, I was sort of like, I'm really good at uh, self gaslighting. <laughs> I'm like my own worst enemy in some ways. And I thought like, how could I possibly fit into this? How could anybody take me seriously, when I don't even have one beige hemp article of clothing in my closet. And because I don't, I'm not like an upper class yoga mom, you know, and right. like, and then I said, No, but like, you know, I had to like sit down and talk myself off the ledge because I'm also, in addition to being really good at gaslighting myself, I'm also really good at giving myself pep talk. So it balances <laughs> where it was good. like, okay, little teeter -totter. right, 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 exactly. So it was like, Amanda, like more people need to be involved and know about these things and make these changes and fight for these changes than just this like select group of like, you know, incredibly privileged, very specific people. Right. And I just was like, we need to expand who's out there because I think so far the, I mean, and we've seen a lot of change with this the past few years, but you know, in the early days of the pandemic, when I would look out there and see who was involved in the sustainability scene, the slow fashion movement, it was primarily people with a lot of money who had the privilege to invest in that. Mm -hmm. And what it was doing was othering everyone else. And how could you possibly be, like an eco-conscious person if you aren't also drinking green juice and going right. to sweet greens you know right. like and, and it, being vegan it, and and right and condo what's that marie, Con condo marie condo in your house thing, right? yeah 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 it was like you have to be minimalist but in this really expensive way right and you need to be really health conscious in a really expensive way and ultimately that is just not not going to work no. that is like we're never going to see any change at all so I'm excited about things like No Kill that are out there showing this other side of it that actually shows more people. You know, like we all have a place in this. Right. And and talking about um, showing more people, like one thing that we're starting is something called Fashion Love Story, where we're going to profile, uh, well, multiple people, but people, portraits of people wearing something that they own that there's a story behind or that they really love and then probably then a little profile of the person and we're, we're going to actually do this in, in trio so we're, we're going to do like three climate activists um we're going to do three fashion designers um that are based in new york city women who haven't sold out to bigger companies that are like made in new york so in a sense and two of them i know already it's going to be yoli tang and cynthia rowley and so if we look at someone like Cynthia Rowley, you could be like, oh, Katya, how do you think she's sustainable because she uses synthetic fabrics and, mm -hmm. and, you know, but on the flip side, she does small production. She makes it in New York. So there's not the ethical um, factory implications. Um, mm -hmm. And, and she's an independent like woman who's created her own business. And, and so I wanted to be, show that there's a, a wide way we can like define this um in a way for me it's almost just simply like anti-corporate when things are too big like when jeff bezos owns you or lvmh owns you it's yeah you know then you're part of this huge machine where things are outsourced when you're when you when your factories when you don't even know who owns your factories because you were outsourced it so you're not responsible to those people for me that's problematic that's the whole so it's it's sort of big and and from having no kill and constantly doing research my idea of what it means to be sustainable is is constantly like broadening and shifting and mm -hmm. you know I'm learning constantly so I I don't I don't try to approach either like this is the only answer which is also what I think early sustainable fashion the mommy yoga sites are like this this these are the answers for you and and we try to be like these are things we found that are working, but you know, like kind of like Buddhism, like try it yourself. It, does this resonate with you <laughs> yeah. or not? You know, right? Because there are so many ways, different ways to do this, and I do think, you know, once again, 
the sustainable fashion community for so long has been really, whether they've realized or not, really being dictated by brands who it is in their best interest as brands, you know, that are companies selling things to tell you that their path is the right path, the true path and the only path. But, you know, this is this is more complicated than this. And this is personal. And it's about finding what works for you. Right. Let's take a moment to thank a new supporter of Close Horse, Athletic Greens. They have a product I use literally every day. I started taking AG1 because it's important that I feel as healthy and energized as possible. If I'm going to be able to do all the stuff I need to do in a given day, from working my day job, to creating Close Horse, to reading my ever-growing mountain of books, this means I need a supplement that fits into my life easily and is actually enjoyable to take. I've taken some very unenjoyable supplements. For a while, it seemed like half my suitcase for every business trip was just bottles of vitamins, and AG1 has changed my life because it only takes up a tiny, tiny bit of space in my bag, and I really enjoy taking it. Who says that about a supplement? I have never said that before, but I mean it. I've been on it for a few months now, and I love it. It doesn't taste like it's super healthy. It has a kind of mild tropical with a hint of vanilla taste that I actually look forward to each morning. I'm I'm serious. I I'm excited to drink it in the morning. So you're probably asking, like, what is this stuff? Well, with one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food-sourced ingredients, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, aging, all of the things you care about. It's very lifestyle friendly, whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy free or gluten free or only Taco Bell, AG1 fits for you. It also costs you less than $3 a day. It's way cheaper, trust me, I did the math, than getting all of the different supplements yourself, which I appreciate as a very thrifty person. I also love that I'm skipping all of the plastic packaging ways for all of the supplements I was taking in the past. So many containers. I am not an athlete. When I do work out, it's in very uncool pajamas. But AG1 is a small micro habit with big benefits for me. It's one thing I can do every single day to take great care of myself. For every purchase, Athletic Greens donates to organizations helping to get nutritious food to kids in need, including No Kid Hungry here in the United States. In 2020 alone, AG donated over 1.2 million meals to kids. My other vitamins weren't doing anything for anybody else except filling up my suitcase. Right now is a great time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. Shake it up and enjoy it. There's no need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. Seriously, the first thing I do every morning, well, first I feed the cats, but then I mix up my scoop of of AG1 with some water. I shake it up and I sit on the couch and drink it while I listen to NPR and it is delightful. To make it easy, because I know you're so jealous, you want to try this now, Athletic Greens is going to offer you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash clotheshorse. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash clotheshorse to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. That's a great transition to something you and I talked about at length when we were uh, preparing for this that I actually have been thinking about so much all week, which are these like sort of mental gymnastics that so many consumers do that allow them to put their own happiness and the consumption of fast fashion over human rights and environmental justice. Like if you ask the average person, hey, uh, what's more important, you having access to a plethora of cheap, trendy clothes or the human rights of the people who made your your clothes. Of course, they're going to say 
it's the human rights of the people who made the clothes, right? Like no one's right. no one's a monster, right? right. No one is out there like, hey, 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 right. Right. wait, like rubbing their hands together like a villain when they place that she and Hall order, right. right? Like it's that's not how it's going down. Um, there's so many gray areas. Everything's so complicated, right? But nonetheless, people are good, and yet they still are like, well, I do need something new for this wedding, or I do need new fall clothes, or like, how do we help people get over that hurdle? <sighs> I know that's, you know, this is like something I'm thinking about every day. There's no easy answer, right? right. Yeah, it, it's so tough. I'm sure you're familiar with the Remake organization. Um, yes. Yeah, so when Aisha Berenblatt started that, what she first started doing was taking young fashion designers from like Parsons or FIT on basically these field trips to say like Vietnam to a factory to meet the, their peers on the other side. Because a lot of those factory workers were are 18, 19, 20-year-old, you know, women. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. the idea was putting a face, like like a humanity, um, behind it. So there, there's something about that piece. Um, I, because so much of our problem with that is the fact that, you know, up until, this is amazing to think about, I think it was somewhere in like the late 80s, early 90s that, the majority of our things started being made offshore, like elsewhere. Like in the mm-hmm. 60s, 70s, most things like were made in America that we bought here. And it's staggering to think about that now because that's so not the norm. And I think when you're, you know, when it's somebody who lives, you know, down the road or even in the next city from you, that, that factory, you know, you would be supporting those people. And so therefore things could cost more. Um, mm-hmm. that I don't think this is completely answering the question. I'm kind of like, <laughs> kind of <laughs> spitting out, but uh, yeah, how to, how to make people care. It's, it's, yeah, that's such a huge question, Amanda. I don't know. I don't know either. That's why yeah. I was asking you. I mean, I have a few thoughts there because like I have spent so much time thinking about it. Oh, tell me. You know, okay. Let me, okay. For one, yeah. we need to dispel this notion that is, quote, things are different over there, right? Mm-hmm. Or people have different priorities over there. Over, It's always over there. It's right. the distance, right? It's the right. othering. And I think that, you know, I, I don't know how we undo that, like, easily, but that's just fundamentally not true. People are people, Exactly. No matter where they live or what they do, and they have the same insecurities, the same things that make them happy, the same dreams, you know, like, yes, we're all special, unique people, but we're all people is the, is the point. Like people overseas who sew your clothing over there uh, aren't these like automatons who just sew all day and have no nothing else going on. Right. And I think that's one thing I'm constantly thinking about, like, how do we pull back that curtain more and more for other people. The other thing that is a little bit more, is a lot closer to home actually, is you can see the impacts of fast fashion here in the United States. Um, I, I would, have you ever worked retail? Because I sure have. And like retail workers are the domestic evidence of how these, this, this industry treats humans. Um, and surely we all have known someone at some point who has worked in a store if mm-hmm. we have not ourselves. And I have seen as fast fashion grew and clothes became cheaper and faster and there's more of them. At the same time, retail workers were paid less and less, lost access to benefits by being forced to just always be scheduled under full time hours so that no one was required to give them health insurance and holidays and pay time off, all of that stuff. Um and these are people who work under really difficult circumstances and cannot make a living off of what they right. do. Right. That's similar to the Amazon workers. Um, yeah. Same. Another great yeah. example. Yeah, yeah. I've read about that. Like they work in these, you know, these <sighs> warehouses. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> they work in <laughs> warehouses that are like a few football fields big and they can't have their cell phone with them. They have to check. Like they're like treated like worse than children. children yeah 
Like yeah. you have to leave it in yeah. the front. And so then if you have to make an emergency call in your 10 minute break, you have to jog to the front to get your phone. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. And the turnover is super high. So, you know, they're trying to unionize. I think some places they've almost started unionizing. And it's funny. I think, you know, unions need to come back, but that's slightly off topic. There was a leak of an internal memo from Amazon that came out earlier this year that was basically like, we're, we're afraid that we're running out of bodies to hire because the turnover is so high. Like, we don't know what to do. And I see a similar thing happening in retail right now, too, mm-hmm. where, you know, I mean, and fast food, right? Like, right. The, you know, that's why a lot of these businesses are on limited hours. The service is, like, pretty bad. Um, and it's because people are like, I don't want to do it anymore. Or I already did it and it was terrible. Like, I will tell you that I worked retail for about five years and I I have, like, internalized trauma from it that I can't even talk about. But, like, has ruined going to a store shopping for me, you know? And I... I see all like the way Amazon workers are treated, the way t- retail workers are treated, denied benefits, consistent wages and hours, all of that stuff. Uh, it's really a function of this attitude of selling us as much shit as possible, as often as possible at the lowest price, right? right. It's all connected. And it's easy for people to other the people who made their stuff because often it's not made here anymore. Mm-hmm. But the people who deliver your stuff, who sell you that stuff, who fold the things after you try it on, they're right here in front of you. Right. And that's why if you if you say like, sorry, but like people are really far away, I can't wrap my brain around it. Like go to the mall right now. Right. You know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I don't know. That's like one of the big challenges that I am thinking about a lot, which is how we get more people to... Like, I, I don't know. It's like the narrative is either you deny yourself any joy in life to protect others in the planet or you live a happy life and you say fuck it to all of that stuff. And I it's I know that humans are really built for black and white thinking, but we right. need to, like, untangle that and undo that belief. Oh, completely. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, and that's and it's marketing, right there. It, it's just marketing and it's the overproduction. I mean, Fast fashion is a problem, but the bigger problem is simply overproduction. Um, yeah. I did an article recently on No Kill about basically about that because part of it is that it allows regular retailers to kind of avoid scrutiny because they're like, oh, look at the bad fast fashion. And so just for fun, I went to Nordstrom's website and I looked up men's t-shirts and there were 15,000, over 15,000 results. And what? I know, like that's Nordstrom's. That's like, that's not, that's not, that's just crazy. Who, who could even begin to make a decision about which of 15,000? You don't need that many. I mean, exactly. honestly, as soon as you said t-shirts, I knew it was going to get bad because t-shirts are one of those things that overwhelm me with it's like the, basically the illusion of choice. Right. Because ultimately at the end of the day, it's a t-shirt, but even you know, working as a buyer in the past and managing that category specifically, right. <laughs> uh, I was like, why do we have so many t-shirts? They're all the same. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like- <laughs> and, and this is, and when I, I was trying to talk to my, you know, cousin who, who is just like, I love her, but in terms of awareness, she's just like totally normal. So she does, she shops some fast fashion. She so- shops some regular fashion. She, you know, tries to recycle sometime, you know, she's just basic American and no judgment with that. Just giving you her, um, awareness level. And so I was, I was trying to explain to her, you know, my, my problems with fast fashion. And I said it like this. I said, have you ever stopped to think about you're going into Target or Target if you're fancy (laughs) and, (laughs) And you're looking at like these racks of clothes and, and you know, Target's not like a, a mega superstore, but it, it's big enough. And this idea that, you know, someone said, hey, let's just make all these clothes. Let's not see if anybody needs them. We're going to make a ton of things and we're going to just put them on these racks and we're going to put them in these buildings and we're going to get people to come and convince them that they need them. Like, it's actually crazy. 
It's actually crazy when you think of it like that. Like, like who it thought is. this was a good idea? You know, it is interesting. It's like clothing is an amazing. I mean, there are other categories like this, but clothing is an amazing example of like stuff is being made not to fulfill a need, but to make money. Right. Like, it, it, unfortunately, that is what it is. Yes, there are people who need clothes. We all need clothes, or we will, you know, succumb to sunburn and exposure and all that stuff. Fine, but. But, like, we don't need all those clothes all the time. And as a person who's worked as a buyer in this industry, I want to assure you that there has never been a moment in any meeting that I've had throughout my career where someone said, well, what do people need? Ever. It was like, what do we need to make to hit our sales plan? And our sales plan is designed to ensure that we hit a certain profit level. And that profit level is there to ensure that we pay out shareholders and keep our stock price high. It was never like... What is it that people really need right now? Like, I I think about the early days of my career, especially where we were starting to see this shift where people no longer would, like, I, I remember this vaguely as a kid where, like, my grandma would take me shopping, you know, in the middle of summer for a winter coat and snow boots and, like, back to school clothes that I wasn't going to wear for months, right? Like, that's how it used to work. You just went out and got the stuff you needed for the year, and then that was it, right? Like, you weren't idly shopping all the time. And even though I was started my career with a, a big fast fashion retailer whose audience, whose customer base was, like, teens and 20s, we still were delivering product that way. So we would like deliver sandals and shorts and bathing suits in December because it was like, well, people are going to stock up. And then we start, we start to see, I mean, like no shit, right? People are not, people have money to right. just go out and stock up for the year. And that's not how people shop anymore. Right. It's like, it's like when it, they need it, they want it. Right. And we, it was like this huge, like business lesson that took years to fall into place that like, oh, no, we shouldn't deliver sandals in December or mittens in August because no one wants them yet. It took like years. That's so funny. Years for the industry to catch up on that. Like people now are more like we're kind of like an on demand generation Completely. where we just like want it when we want it. Right. And there are many services out there that will ensure that that happens and that we no longer are about like, oh, we get it then because that's when we're supposed to get it. But then we wait, we hold on to it and we don't use it for months. And I think, you know, part of that is like the on-demand culture, but it's also like none of us has like the money in the bank to just go out and stock up for the year. That's just like right. not how we need, we buy things when we can afford them and that's when we need them. Right. Right. And so this whole industry is not about when people need it at all or what they need. It's about like, here's the stuff we got to sell. Right. Um, and I think like going to a Target is a great example of that. Like there's so much clothing in there and there are influencers who just share Target clothes all day, every yeah. day. That's crazy. That's it. And it's I like can see lifestyle. that. It's a lifestyle. Like yeah. you, I mean, I, I don't go to Target much simply, I think, because I live in Brooklyn. There's not convenient Targets. But, right. you know... If, I go visit my family and I just like need to go out of the house. Like, Oh, go to target. Like literally that's like, you can do that. And I could definitely go there and find things I need. And I'll put that in quotations because if I didn't walk into that target, I wouldn't have seen that thing I need, but it'll be, <laughs> you know, it'll be priced yeah. at a point where I'm like, Oh yeah, I think I need like, Oh, I need this, you know, whether clothing or a moisturizer, you know, target has everything. So, um, yeah, it's, it's crazy like that. I remember when I first learned, that a country, and I feel like I was old when I learned this. I didn't, I don't know how, like college age at least, but that country's health is like judged by the GDP. And I was like, what does GDP mean? They're like gross domestic product. I'm like, but what does that mean? They're like, how much you sell? I'm like, wait, a country is considered good by how much it sells. And <laughs> it seems really naive, but I was like shocked with that. I thought like, what about like the health of the people? Or, I mean, I honestly had this... <laughs> naive thought like we were judged by things better than just how much we sell it's true it's like it's not like oh how long people live or how happy they are or how educated they are no it's about like how much stuff we buy right i mean i definitely have gone down many rabbit holes about how basically since the 80s especially i mean also since world war ii but the 80s like they really hit the put the pedal on the gas put the foot on the gas pedal there you go um with ensuring that we were all workers and consumers first and anything else second, you know? And like, that is ultimately where we are. Like we exist to shop 
and work. I mean, I know anyone who's listening to this is like, uh, d- that's depressing. Don't say that. And I agree. Right. That is not who we are. Right. But unfortunately, that is how you know our economy functions how our nations function how exactly. the world view is right now right. and and we need to change that and i think that sometimes we don't realize it but by saying like oh well i need i need a new outfit i need a bunch of new outfits it's a human right basically <laughs> uh that trumps all over human rights right. uh we might be like playing into that really uh, distorted view of what life is you know <laughs> yeah exactly and i want to add one thing that i've i because i've you know overconsumption and consuming has been something that i've again self-educated since learning about things and you mentioned the 80s and i think you're right and i think part of the reason the 80s too is like starting in the 70s and then the 80s and going forward credit credit cards became way more of a thing and way more accessible mm-hmm. i mean i remember going to college and like Hi, get a free frisbee and water bottle when you get a credit card. And I went to credit card debt immediately. Like, oh, I, I remember because, this era. Like, yeah. yeah, and it's like, no, they. Yeah, hi, hi, I'm a college kid. I, I, you know, I work as a waitress. You know, like you're gonna give me credit. You're gonna give me like ten thousand dollar credit. Are you crazy? No, they were smart, but not. You know, but so if we couldn't buy so much beyond what we can actually afford in our bank account, this wouldn't be happening. But then we wouldn't have that great GDP. So it's it's a it's a really wicked cycle that you know we get stuck on. Also, in the eighties, uh, the Reagan administration basically threw out well stopped funding home economics and industrial art programs in school. Mm. Uh, instead, deciding that they wanted to focus on job skills, turning huh. people into workers, and as a pleasant side effect, which I don't know if this was. I, I mean, I, these people were pretty brilliantly evil, so probably right. they considered this too. Now we're like two generations deep into people who don't know how to cook or do laundry right. or sew or repair clothing. I know. And guess what that forces us to do? Consume even more. Right. You know, at my last job, I worked with a lot of people who couldn't cook at all. And so like, for example, my assistant would every day after work go to Sweet Greens and buy two meals. One was dinner and one was going to be lunch for the next day. And that was like par for the course at my office. Like right. people didn't know how to cook or fix things. They would throw out clothing because it had a rip. And it wasn't because they were bad people who don't care about anyone. It was because they don't know how to. Right. But I'm sure they're really great at whatever these other job skills were being thrown out there. Exactly. I, it, it's learn, It's a learned help helplessness. And yeah. I, don't, I don't know if, um, if you're familiar, you probably are familiar with the right to repair movement that's happening yes yes so i mean it's really it, it they're doing it for like things like electronics and what where i really see it like wow is like farmers i think are like suing like deer tractors because deer tractors mm-hmm. have gotten so computerized that they can't fix their own tools and it's insane amount of money and it and, and that's planned that's like a planned thing and so let's just again oh, yeah. let's invent our own future and be you know Where's that, you know, where's the tractor that's you can repair yourself? They're going to get a lot of orders, you know. But Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and like we're as consumers we're part of that. Like maybe we're not out there buying tractors. Right. right? But there are <laughs> other things that we can we can educate ourselves and be sure that when we do need to buy something, we're buying it for, from companies that are thinking about this new future. And that sometimes that is going to cost a little bit more money cuz guess what? We're really confused about the value of things. Yes, totally. And also, um, there's another sort of movement for people to like learn to get things tailored and altered. So maybe you can't become the expert sewer, but instead of just trashing something or, you know, saying, I can't buy this because it doesn't fit me perfectly, take it to, you know, a tailor or alteration place um, to prolong its life and, and also to give someone else work who has that skill. Totally. Totally. I agree. I mean, this is our, I like to think of this as like our future economy and it's different. And like, let's start it now. Exactly. Where, where things are made here, where we make things last, where if we can't repair something ourselves, that's fine. There's someone else out there who makes a living repairing it. And it's all like good work, you know? Yep. Exactly. Um, You know, something else you and I talked about was this idea that I think really fuels some of the worst worst companies retailers out there is this idea that convenience is a human right 
and that convenience trumps everything else in our lives, it's always way more important than anything other aspect of our existence is like this right to convenience. And you said something when we were talking about that that <clears throat> really stuck with me. You said inconvenience is baked into the capitalist system, right? And then we like have to buy our way out of it, basically. Yeah, exactly. And the pandemic kind of, in a way, made it, it made it worse in a sense that it, you really had to go online to like get everything you needed. Well, during the pandemic, I think there were problems because then there were shortages. But I, I feel like there, it's gotten some people to like be like, oh, I'll never go to like Costco again. I'll just order everything to be delivered to me. I'll order, you know. Uh, and, I know. And it's tricky, and I, I get it. Like I. I get the impulse of like, you know, oh, Amazon, it can, I can be here the next day, but I would so rather support like a local business. And I don't mean this in a holier than thou way. Like I, I'm not perfect. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'm like, oh, I really need this tomorrow for whatever reason um, I do. But, you know, for the most part, I try to, you know, first go local. Secondly, if I need to order online, do it by a smaller company. And part of that is um, we have like a gift guide every <laughs> during the holidays on no kill and there was a company that has sort of like i know some like plant kit for kids and i found it on amazon and i found their website and i didn't find any anywhere else and i emailed the company and i said hey i really love your kit i'm only seeing it on amazon i really prefer not to put any links to amazon but i like it well enough that if that's the only place you sell it then you know i'll put it on and the I will never forget, like, the owner wrote me back. And he was like, thank you so much. Amazon ends up, like, taking so much of our profit. And mm -hmm. we're, like... Oh, my God, yeah. And we're in the process of, like, getting our own site together. So, like, if you can wait till, like, whatever time and just put our site, we would so appreciate it. And I was like, absolutely. That, it's a win-win. But I, I don't sell on Amazon, so I don't know these things. But, of course, that makes sense. So, um, yeah, it's, I, I think... Again, it's looking at that bigger picture and the interconnectedness of everyone and our humanity. And and again, I think in some ways, well, some ways like just being the internet or some ways like the pandemic, it's, it's separated people and just pol politics that we forget that we're all like interconnected mm -hmm. and that that's messes things up. <laughs> that's a, that's a scientific term messes things up, but <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. I mean, I think it's nice. I mean, we still, there's still a pandemic going on, but you know, a lot of us are starting to slowly get out there in the world again. And it is reminding me of how much I missed in-person interactions with people mm -hmm. and how different they are, which is not to say like social media is real life and everybody needs to stop pretending it's not right because we learn a lot from social media. We mimic things we see on social media. We meet people on social media. We share information that way. We are assholes to each other on social media and it hurts our feelings in real life. Right. So like social media is real, but I do think like it's two years in our houses alone uh, really really changed uh, th a lot of the ways we connect with humanity. And it's sort of like we're relearning. But I also think like the humanity, the, the pandemic and basically not leaving my house for well more than a year at all, um, except to run errands like wrapped in plastic practically because <laughs> I'm so fearful, right. uh, reminded me or taught me that I don't want everything to just show up at my house, that I want to go out there and have the experience of finding it and feeling like I'm making the best decisions because it's right there in front of me. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it made buying things online just like only something that happens when it's really urgently needed, you know? Yeah. Um, and it made it even more appealing to go out there and shop local and shop small. I, I, a few years ago, I was definitely helping a lot of different clients set up Amazon stores. Um, I think that a lot less of that is happening now mm -hmm. because you know, Amazon, uh, we already know it's like bad for its workers, right? Mm -hmm. It's really bad for a lot of the small businesses that are selling on that platform. Like, I don't know how they make the math work because I even I had like a client last year who was doing a pretty decent uh, Amazon business and like they were addicted to the money that was coming in. But when you sat down and sort of like reconciled it, they weren't really making much in the way of profit because 
Amazon nickels and dimes these small businesses and every in every possible regard. It's ridiculous. Like they get charged to have their stuff there. If it doesn't hit, hit a certain selling point, they get charged for this uh. and that. And like, there's just fees on fees on fees. And I actually, not only do I f- fear and, and know that Amazon is leading people, small businesses into a very financially tenuous situation, I also think it is having this downstream impact where it's like these brands, these small businesses are handing more and more money over to Amazon each week to do business. And they have to make that up somewhere, which is with the people who make the products or the materials. Right. And so people downstream are being paid even less. You know, there's this like pressure. And like, I, I think it's really, it seems easy or low hanging fruit to villainize Amazon. But I think that, People don't really understand. Amazon is so massive now that it is impacting every single person in at least one way. Even if you are like, oh, I don't shop Amazon. I don't even have a Prime membership. I guarantee there are extra trucks driving up and down your street, which are affecting the air quality. Like it's, it's, it's everyone is being touched by this. Right. And it's not good. It's not like we're being touched in a good way. You know, it's a bad touch. Right. (laughs) It is. It is. Let's take a moment to thank some of the incredible small businesses who keep Clothes Horse going via their generous Patreon support. Selena Sanders, a social impact brand that specializes in upcycled clothing using only reclaimed vintage or thrifted materials from tea towels, linens, blankets, and quilts. Sustainably crafted in Los Angeles, each piece is designed to last in one's closet for generations to come. Maximum style, minimal carbon footprint. Shift clothing out of beautiful Astoria, Oregon, with a focus on natural fibers, simple hardworking designs, and putting fat people first. Discover more at shiftwheeler.com. Late to the party, creating one-of-a-kind statement clothing from vintage, salvaged, and thrifted textiles. They hope to tap into the dreamy memories we all hold. Floral curtains, a childhood dress, the wallpaper in your best friend's rec room all while creating modern, sustainable garments that you'll love wearing and have for years to come. Late to the Party is passionate about celebrating and preserving textiles, the memories they hold, and the stories they have yet to tell. Check them out on Instagram at Late to the Party People. Vino Vintage, based just outside of LA. We love the hunt of shopping secondhand because you never know what you might find. Catch us at flea markets around Southern California by following us on Instagram at vino.vintage so you don't miss our next event. Gabriella Antonis is a visual artist and an ethical trade fashion designer. But Gabriella is also a radical feminist micro business. She's the one woman band trying to help you understand why slow fashion is what the earth needs. The one woman band to help you build your own brand. She can take your fashion line from just a concept and do your sketches, pattern making, grading, sourcing, cutting, and sewing. The second option is for those who aren't trying to start a business and who just want ethical garments. Gabriella Antonis will create custom made to measure garments just for you. Her goal is to help help one person of any size at a time, including beyond size 40. To inquire about this serendipitous intersectional offering of either concept, DM her on Instagram to book a consultation. Please follow her on Instagram and Twitter at Gabriella Antonis. And that's Gabriella with one L. Gotta get that spelling right. Dylan Page is an online clothing and lifestyle brand based out of St. Louis, Missouri. Our products are chosen with intention for the conscious community. Everything we carry is animal-friendly, ethically made, sustainably sourced, and cruelty-free. Dylan Page is for those who never stop questioning where something comes from. We know that personal experience dictates what's sustainable for you, and we are here to help guide and support you to make choices that fit your needs. Check us out at dylanpage.com and find us on Instagram at dylanpagelifeandstyle. Salt Hats, purveyors of truly sustainable hats, hand-blocked, sewn, and embellished in Detroit, Michigan. Find us on Instagram at Salt Hats. Gentle Vibes Vintage. 
We are purveyors of polyester and psychedelic relics. We encourage experimentation and play, not only in your wardrobe, but in your home too. We have thousands of killer vintage pieces ready for their next adventure. See them all on Instagram at Gentle Vibes Vintage. Thumbprint is Detroit's only fair trade marketplace located in the historic Eastern Market. Our small business specializes in products handmade by empowered women in South Africa, making a living wage, creating things they love like hand-painted candles and ceramics. We also carry a curated assortment of sustainable and natural locally made goods. Thumbprint is a great gift destination for both the special people in your life and for yourself. Browse our online store at thumbprintdetroit.com and find us on Instagram at Thumbprint Detroit. High Energy Vintage is a fun and funky vintage shop located in Somerville, Massachusetts, just a few minutes away from downtown Boston. They offer a highly curated selection of bright and colorful clothing and accessories from the 1940s to the 1990s for people of all genders. Husband and wife duo Wiley and Jessamy handpick each piece for quality and style with a focus on pieces that transcend trends and will find a home in your closet for many years to come. In addition to clothing, the shop also features a large selection of vintage vinyl and old school video games. Find them on Instagram at High Energy Vintage, online at HighEnergyVintage.com, and at markets in and around Boston. Vagabond Vintage DTLV is a vintage clothing, accessories, and decor reselling business based in downtown Las Vegas, Nevada. Not only do we sell in Las Vegas, but we're also located throughout resale markets in San Francisco, as well as at a curated boutique called Lux and Ivy located in Indianapolis, Indiana. Jessica, the founder and owner of Vagabond Vintage DTLV, recently opened the first IRL location located in the Arts District of downtown Las Vegas on August 5th. The shop has a strong emphasis on 60s and 70s garments, single stitch tees, and dreamy loungewear. Follow them on Instagram at Vagabond Vintage DTLV and keep an eye out for their website coming fall of 2022. You told me something that infuriated me, disappointed me, filled me with despair, which is that the CFDA is partnering with Amazon. Yes, I am. I am so upset about this. So for people who don't know, CFDA is the Council of Fashion Designers of America, and their whole MO there is to help support American fashion and, and help it grow. And so Amazon has wanted to get into high fashion forever. Um, They've tried numerous times. It almost became a joke because, I mean, think about it. I I can't imagine if I'm going to put down $500 on up to like several thousand on something that I'm going to want to order it from Amazon, that I'm not going to want to go to the store and get that treatment and be treated so nicely and have it tried on and have the salesperson tell me I look amazing. Like, Shouldn't that be part of that whole price that I'm paying? Um, yes, I agree. <laughs> I I don't need it to come to my house right. untried on and then deal with the returning it. Yeah. That's and, the and, thing. Like, I just don't get it. <laughs> I know. And and also, like, I, I imagine something like that. They'd be like, oh, here, and we have a tailor. Let, let's, let's pin this perfectly for you now, and we can take it in, or we can shorten it for you, or, you know, X, Y, or Z. Like... You know, I I don't shop those things, but if I did, that is what I'd want. Um, That's what I want anyway, but (laughs) it doesn't happen. But um, (laughs) so this idea that their, you know, their new, uh, you know, initiatives are being, you know, sponsored by Amazon. And if you go to like their Instagram account, it says straight up on there, like in partnership with Amazon. It just, Uh. it makes me so upset because... If we want to support American fashion designers, upcoming designers, shouldn't part of what we do um, be to like bake in a sense of sustainability and responsibility to, you know, your community and your community is like your workers, your community is, you know, everything, right? You know, the, the shoppers and Amazon is like so blatantly could care less. We already know they don't care about workers. We know that, you know, they have no sustainability initiative. They don't even pretend to. And so <laughs> for 
you know, for the Council of Fashion Designers of America to be like, hi, we're partnering, you know, with Amazon. And the thing is, and which I'd mentioned we were talking, Amanda, is it's not like these people don't have money. Like, I mean, I know. On, it's not like it's not like they don't like Anna Winter has her Met Gala and raises millions for the Met. Diana von Furstenberg, Diane, excuse me, von Furstenberg was was the president of it forever. And she's married to a billionaire. She might be a billionaire in her own right. You know, Tom Ford is not like on welfare. So it's like, why do they need that's just complete greed. It's greed on both their parts. I, I think that like, you know, CFD, like fashion, traditional fashion, I think is, a, you know, running scared of, you know, how international things have become, how accessible things have become online. I don't know what they're, you know, they, they just want money and Amazon wants like the prestige or whatever they think they want of pairing with, you know, this high fashion. Ugh. And, and similar to what you were talking about, like these small, uh, companies getting nickel and dime, you know, that these fancy designers aren't, you know, again, there's going to be disparity, how they're getting treated by Amazon, you know, is not going to be the same because they want those labels. No. Oh, that. Exactly. So it's oh, like, exactly. You know, it just, <sighs> yeah, it's, more yeah no, it's totally true. <laughs> it's, it's frustrating because I think, you know, people who are listening to this podcast, a lot of the people who are in our social circles in this space know unequivocally that Amazon is bad news and has a, a lot of really negative impacts on the planet and its people. Like, we all know that. But there are plenty, many more people out there, I might add, who are like, Amazon is so great. They have everything I need. It comes really fast. It's like infinite choice in terms of like what's on the site. They And they work with all of these like highly reputable brands, you know, because like more and more you can find just about any brand that you trust, whether why you trust them is up to, is your own personal choice, right. but you can find them on Amazon. And then to take it to the next level, we're like, oh my God, the CFDA is partnering with Amazon. Like, what, where's Tim Gunn? Is right. he like a part of this, you know? And like people love Tim Gunn. So right. they're like, oh my God, well, he loves Amazon. One more reason for us to love Amazon or keep shopping there rather than shopping with local businesses or any, you know, yeah. anywhere else. And it's, it's very beneficial for Amazon. I'm not really sure how it's beneficial for CFDA unless they're just getting a big fat check. For I think I, they something. must. Yeah, they absolutely must. But be. for, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's all it is because yeah. I feel like if they had done this 10 years ago, it would have been very damaging for the CFDA. Like, right. ew, Amazon. Exactly. And, it kind of, I guess it's like on us to make it have that same impact now. Exactly. Like, because I look at it now and I'm like, oh my God, that's disgusting. I hate this. You know, we need to be loud about that and explain to other people why this is a problem. Um, but like, like I said, the majority of people don't know that Amazon is a problem, you know, mm -hmm. it, which is shocking to me because I feel like it's, I don't know. I think I spent a lot of time on Reddit. So it's like very abundantly clear to me, <laughs> but you know, right. like it, it's interesting because I just, I don't know how anyone at this point hasn't heard something bad about Amazon. Right. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know either, but you're right. I don't even go on Reddit and I know all about how bad Amazon is. I know. So. I was just assuming that's yeah. where I was getting from. You know, yeah. there was a point during the first year of the pandemic where I, you know, I had lost my job at the beginning and unemployment benefits were like, I mean, in Pennsylvania, where I was living at the time, the system was like just collapsing like it was in many states. Right. And so I would go months without getting paid any of my unemployment benefits. Oh. And like we had to move out of the city, move out to the country so that like we could just live off of what my husband was making to pay rent, which was like not much money. I've always been the like primary breadwinner in our family. And, you know, we, we gave up a lot of things and we were like, it's just okay. You know, this is like, we're all in on like being the best people we can be during the pandemic. Right. And there was a point where I was like, I can't go another month without any unemployment benefits. And I can't even like, I had applied at every grocery store, every, every big box store for a job. They would look at my resume and be like, why would someone who is like a professional, a white collar professional come and take this job as if like, hi, have you heard what's going on in the world? Right. Um, where I, so we've reached this point where I was like, I'm get, if I don't get my, uh, all my back benefits, like next week, I'm going to go apply at an Amazon warehouse. And if this was a thing that like 
my husband and I like cried about like, like what, what a hellish unfair thing to happen. And I said, you know, the thing is like, I'm not too good for any kind of work, but this job, like working in an Amazon warehouse is too bad for every person involved. Right. Like that's why I'm crying about it. Otherwise, you know, it'd be a great chance to get my steps in or something <laughs> because we know that like, I'm not even going to be allowed to use the bathroom when I work there. Right. Or I'm going to have to run to football fields to text my husband, you right. know, like yeah. things like that. Yeah. And so I, I just, uh, it feels like, always feels like low hanging fruit to bag on Amazon. But then I see people like posting all the stuff they bought at Amazon. So there you go. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's Amazon influencers. I know. There's a lot of them. <laughs> okay. So, you know, one of the myths out there, and I do think this partially comes from this idea of, you know, the sustainable slow fashion community really being dictated by brands within it for so long. The idea out there is that you can't have unique style or even dress creatively and also be making the most sustainable decisions. And I know that that is a big part of, of the narrative that No Kill is working to dismantle, right? Right. I would love to hear about your journey to starting No Kill because I think it's a really, I know that you believe that you can have incredible style and not be shopping fast fashion. But I think your personal journey to starting No Kill really illustrates why you believe that. So I thought maybe you could share a little bit with that with us. Sure. Um, I'm going to go way back and then you can edit some of this out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or not. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, or not. Um, uh, Cause I, I was thinking about that this morning, knowing that we were going to talk and I really, I really went, um, kind of went way back to thinking even before no kill, just about, you know, fashion. And, um, one thing I realized is I grew up Catholic, which I'm not, I don't identify as Catholic anymore. Um, I'm not a fan of organized religion in general, so it's not anti-Catholic, but we could say I'm not a huge fan of organized religion because I think it's a root of a lot of oppression. But, um, mm -hmm. but it affected me in a number of ways. And one thing was it sent me a really strong message, at least in my household, that wanting more than what was absolutely necessary was somehow wrong or immoral. And mm -hmm. especially like wanting frivolous things. And so, and it, it was hard because as a kid, I desperately loved beautiful things. Like I just, you know, I like the hot pink Barbie and the real Barbie, not the generic $1.99 fashion doll where, where the hair would flip up and it would actually be bald, but the full head hair Barbie. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you have I know, I know, no. I know the distinction very well. Right, right. Because I definitely had a lot of the ones where you pulled up the hair and they were bald. Right, exactly, right. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So I, so I really, I felt like I was out of place in like my own personal world, like, of, of where I grew up because I always kind of wanted more. And then I had a best mm -hmm. friend who sort of had everything because her, her parents were divorced and they gave her things as a battle for her affections, which caused her other problems, I'm sure. But as a kid, she had a lot of stuff. So it was fun to play at her house. Um, but so that there's that sort of thing that kind of fed into me. And the other thing is I went to a uh, Catholic school with uniforms for, 11 of my 12. Oh no. Years. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, to say I hated those uniforms is like an understatement. And one of the reasons is that as someone who was like, you know, very straight middle class, like you, I, you had the plaid skirt, but then you had to wear like the white or yellow sweater or top. And, mm -hmm. you know, my mom got us like the standard uniform ones. That's it. But the, other kids could get like, you know, the Ralph Lauren thing or the Abercrombie and Fitch thing, you know, so they could signify their wealth and status through what they were wearing and still be wearing the uniform. And I felt like I had no opportunity for self-expression because I couldn't afford the status symbols and there wasn't an alternative way to like style the uniform. Um, <laughs> so it was, yeah, I know it's kind of crazy. And so one year, my um, junior year in high school, my mother finally relented and let me go to public school because I, you know, I've been fighting her since like I was 10 that I hated 
Catholic school. And it really proved to be transformational for me on so many levels. And one of them was I finally, you know, didn't have to wear uniforms. And I was all, always a thrifter. Like, I, you know, I didn't have a lot of money, but I just loved older clothes anyway. So I was kind of like a natural thrifter. And I thrifted in my grandmother's mm -hmm. attic. And, you know, um, and I like to kind of sew things myself. Like, if Depop was around at that time, I probably would have set up my own store of, like, making things. But... Um, that was all pre-internet. Um, and <laughs> so for the first 30 days of school, I didn't wear the same thing twice because I planned out all my outfits. And, you know, a lot of them were like things I made myself or, you know, thrifted. But I was like so excited about being able to express myself and what I was wearing because I was kind of shy and kind of introverted. But I always loved fashion. And I finally had this opportunity to, you know, be dressed up among my peers on a daily basis. Um, and so that, that was really big. And I also discovered other like kooky alternative fashion kids and thrifting kids that again, if internet was around at the time, I would have seen them on Instagram, but it wasn't. So I had felt very isolated in my like suburban, you know, Catholic school. So being able to go to this other school and have this happen, um, really showed me sort of like the power of fashion, um, mm -hmm. which, which I think is, um, yeah, I think that's really important. And then, um, let's fast forward to like, I moved to New York because that's where people go when they love fashion and <laughs> it's true. You know, that's I mean, how I ended up there. And, yeah. and you just need to get out of where you're from and, and you need to feel included totally. somewhere. And around 2008 was when, um, Tavi started her blog and it's more specifically, I saw a 12 year old dressed like an eccentric old grandmother get invited to fashion shows. And I was like, wait, <laughs> what? Like, cause up to that point, like fashion was ruled by the top, you know, like, yeah, totally. This is, this is what you wear. This is who says you wear it. There's kind of some alternative cool magazines, maybe out of London or like the East village. But you know, I wasn't cool enough to like be a part of that scene. And so, but as like, Hey, there's a 12 year old doing this. And then style blogs happened. And I really started to pay attention to that because those were quote unquote real people in fashion. Um, but I noticed that all those real people were expensively dressed or they were like genetically gifted, like models. <laughs> and or. Yes, yeah, yes. Totally. All of the above, right? And so I was like, <laughs> right, yeah. wow, this is like, I, you know, I love looking at these, but I felt like there was something missing. And I felt what was missing, if I really think about it, it was like my kooky like high school self who liked to thrift and then or like then when I went to New York and I used to sort of be like a club kid dancer like the nightlife kids I saw and I felt like you know the style blogs were missing representation of people who had no money but were super creative with their clothes um so I decided to start my own and it was called style defined NYC and that was like from 2008 to 2014 and it was it changed my life, basically. I didn't make money while while I was doing it, but it did give me some opportunities in terms of like some photography, um, some freelance photography things. And I inadvertently ended up selling it, um, which was crazy, which is a whole other thing. But what I did- Wow. Is, I know. <laughs> is, it's, well, I honestly think I, I got a, a certain amount of traffic. This was ages ago. This was when it was like a blogger blog. That's how, how it started. Um, mm -hmm. and I got a certain amount of traffic and I think somebody saw it and they wanted the name and the traffic more than ah. the content. And when they offered to buy it from me, I, it just was at this, a perfect crossroads for me that I'd been doing it for several years. I was kind of burnt out. Um, street mm -hmm. style was no longer a niche thing. Like even Vogue was having it. So you know, it wasn't as unique. And I used to go out a lot at night and take a bunch of pictures and put a photo up every single day. And so, um, I was tired. I was just like, I don't want to be out till like two in the, I just, you know, I, I just, yeah, I, I get it. You know. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that ended in 2014. Um, but like I mentioned in 2015, I saw the, the true cost and I started, a little bit before the pandemic, I really felt like I want to get my own online 
publication again. I just, I liked having a voice. I liked having something out there. Mm-hmm. And I knew I wanted to be sus- something with sustainability. And so at first I thought it was going to be with food and it was going to be called honey and hemp. And, and, but that wasn't resonating with me. And so um, I was actually meeting with a PR person um, named Kelly Cutrone and said, I have this idea for a site, but I don't, this is really funny. I said, I don't want to start it unless you think it's something that's going to make money because I did this other one. It was so much work. It didn't really make money. So I don't want to do another one. And she's like, Uh she's like, oh yeah, yeah, that can make money. Okay. Kelly, I'm still waiting for that, but. uh, Oh my God. No, I think that is like, I, a conversation I want to be having more often. So I'm glad I just want to, then we'll go back to your story. But, uh, I went to an event here in Austin on Friday night that was hosted by sustain another online magazine. And the founder was very explicit, Reza. She said, like, I don't make any money off of this. I work a day job so that I can keep doing this because I'm so passionate about the work I do. And, you know, that's the same for Close Horse. Uh, My goal is just to not at least lose money on Close Horse. And I'm sure you feel similarly about No Kill. Mm -hmm. But we do it because it's important to us. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, And I think that's something a lot of people would struggle to understand, that you would put so much, so much unpaid labor into something that you love so much. Yeah. But, you know, and, but I think, you know, it's funny cause you say that, but it's like, I don't, we don't, we don't question like artists, like an artist, maybe they'll paint and maybe they're hoping that they'll sell things in a gallery, but maybe they just love painting. It's, they need to express something. And I think, I mean, I'm not saying like, Oh, what we're doing is an art, but it's a form of expression and also a form of communication. And so I think mm-hmm. when you have a message and a purpose, like you're just going to try to get it out there. Totally. Totally. I mean, to me, like there are times when I'm like, I need to take a break, mm-hmm. but in general, like, cause I will get people who are like, I can't believe you do this. Why do you work so hard? Blah, blah, yes. blah. And it's like, I don't, it doesn't feel like that to me, but it feels shamey when people say that to right. me. Right. Do you know what I mean? I, like <laughs> I do. I do because when I go on family quote unquote vacations that are really extended, um, and they're, they're probably stressful. They're, they're always, <laughs> and I'll have my laptop and I'll go and work for like three or four hours because that makes me happy. And they're like, what, why are you just working? I'm like, well, why are you playing pickleball in the sun? Which is bad for you. You know, like, <laughs> I'm like, you do you, I do me. Why well, I'm not, I don't sit there and question your pickleball and wine tasting. So let me, you know, do what I want to do. Oh, yeah, no, totally. I will say that, like, my husband, Dustin, and I are a really good match in that way. Like, we, early in the pandemic, we did something that was really crazy for us because, you know, we're not, like, wealthy people, but we bought an RV. Um, and, I mean, like, a, a very used RV. It's, like, 30 years old. Mm-hmm. But uh, we, you know, we were able to, like, scrape the money together to do it. And also, we were like, this is so the era we live in right now we're like it will be nice to have a home if everything else falls apart isn't that (laughs) i mean i know that this is not a feeling that is foreign to people who are listening to this conversation where you're like okay finally for the first time ever we know that we have shelter right if everything else falls apart because it's kind of like where our life was at this point and it's not like this rv was that that much money right um but so you know now we like we'll just go away for a weekend in it. And it's like, there's always time where we're both sitting on our computers working on our like passion projects. Um, even though like we're, we're probably supposed to be hiking or something, but we're like, this is, this is how we, we are happy, you know? And so we set up the RV to be good for working, you know, doing computer work and being online and stuff like that. And, uh, we both are always like, we're drinking our coffee, we're listening to NPR and we're both like, I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, on Photoshop right now making Instagram posts for clothes horse. You know, like that's, that's just, right. and, and we're happy. That's exactly. a happy place. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think <laughs> I'm glad we're talking about this. <laughs> I know I, I get, I get shamed a lot for being a quote unquote workaholic. And I'm like, um, I'm doing something I love and hopefully it's contributing to the world and creating community. How's your Netflix binge going? Like, I, I mean, I don't say that back to them, but I, this is so funny. I'm, I'm seriously feeling how this is just completely striking a nerve within me that I don't normally <laughs> allow to express. Because <laughs> honestly, I don't care about like people's Netflix binge or whatever, but I, I, I do care that they look at like me or people like at us doing things, being crazy 
because we're making something. Like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I and I think this is like I, I know that there are going to be people listening to this who this resonates with them too. Like this is my happy place. Yes, you know, um, and yeah, sometimes I watch Netflix. Actually, I don't. I cancel my Netflix because <laughs> of all their transphobic content. But like I, you know, I sometimes will like watch a Lifetime movie or something, and like you know, that's not has no intellectual value right. in my life. But I need that reset. But I also. I feel motivated and happy and, I don't know, excited when I do this work, too. And I don't get that necessarily from my day job all the time, so it's a good feeling. Right, exactly. And, and I think part of our human need is, is to feel like we have a purpose. And it, someone's yeah. purpose could be like raising their kid perfectly or, or, or even raising their dog. I don't care. Just, just don't give me shade for my purpose and <laughs> spending a lot of time on it. Right, right. Well, I mean, I think that's like if you want to extend that metaphor, if your purpose in life is raising your kids well or the people you love or your dog or whatever, um, do you just like forget them when you go on vacation? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) No. (laughs) But if you do, I'm sure there's a good reason why. And I'm glad that you're taking that time for yourself. (laughs) You know? I also understand that. Um, yeah, but I'm glad, I'm glad we're talking about this. Like, this is stuff we do because we we care. Right. And, you know, it's important to us. It's so important that, like, we're not, you know, making enough money off of this to, like, get a yacht or even, you know, a new computer, right. per se. Um, okay. So, anyway, back to you. Do we... I, we just like went, we took a big left turn there. It was all my fault. Oh, no, um, no, that's we, fine. Is there more of your story? Is so, there more of your story here that you want to talk No, so basically... Um, yeah, so Kelly Patron was like, oh, absolutely, that could make money. And that's so why I decided to take the jump of starting No Kill. But she did. I will credit her with coming up with the name No Kill because I said, I don't have a good name. I said it was called Honey and Hemp. She goes, that's terrible. I'm like, I know, it's terrible. I even It's briefly, terrible. It made me think of a granola bar. I know. Well, <laughs> I, well, in, in my limited defense, um, at the time, I, th- I thought my friend was going to do things about cooking. So that would be like a honey part and then hemp, like clothes, which I don't even own any hemp clothing. But, you know, I was just, I was, you know, a little lost in the wilderness. And I had two seconds of honey and hemp Instagram and all I got were like ads for like cannabis. So I like knew I was like not in the right, <laughs> right um, space for that. Um, but I love no kill. She, that's the first thing she said. She goes, how about no kill? And she goes, oh no, that's probably terrible. And she's, but she said, you know, like no kill people or the planet. And I really liked it because it sort of has this like, it made me think of like a punk band. Like one of those things, like you don't know what yeah! it is, you know? Me too. Actually, I thought like when we, the first time we talked, I was like, I bet she is so punk. <laughs> I really thought you were going to, I yeah. I don't know what that would translate as right. on the phone, but I was like, I'm going to know. That was my expectation. Right. Like in my mind, you were like in full punk outfit right. we talking. <laughs> I love it I think it is such a good name you know it's so it just evokes so many right images for what you're doing yeah it, it's fun and we can sort of change it up so so that's how it started and and it just started with me doing some articles and like I said I have I think because of the pandemic, I was able to get, you know, some remote interns and every semester I have some. And so they do some writing, which it's a really good mentorship thing for them, actually, um, as well, because, you know, I I go through their writing. It's not like, hi, they write and I just publish it. Um, No, but (laughs) I wish I wish it'd be so nice. But um, it'd be convenient. Yes, it'd be convenient. (laughs) But that allows us to have, you know, more articles than just me because I want to expand and sometimes people will approach me and say hey I'd like to write an article for you and I'm like okay that's great there's not a budget but it you know if it aligns um it has to be aligning not those I'm sure you get these two like I you know hi I I have a dentist office and I'd like to write this article and basically because they want to link back to their site or something I don't do those at all um I'm super careful yeah. not to just do the, the spammy ones but people who just want to write because they want to write um yeah so it's been yeah it's been exciting and it's been fun and it's been a lot a lot of work um but but it's been good yesterday actually we just did a photo shoot of vintage lacroix clothing because we had access to it and you know 
wearing second, okay, vintage Le Bois, not exactly just secondhand, but, um, you know, we, we, we mixed it up with like, you know, regular things, but just to be like, Hey, look at old things, look at styling, look at, you know, again, let's mm -hmm. make fashion fun. Let's, let's show a gamut of like what fashion can be other than like the new thing or, you know, um, so we're trying to do a range of things like that as well. I mean, honestly, as you're talking about that, I was thinking about a game I used to play with myself in the pre-reality -re television era. So this is not something I co-opted from television where I'd go into a thrift store or any store and I would mentally be like, what are the outfits I would make out of this place? Like what I find specifically just what mm -hmm. I find here. And it's because I really enjoy the creative challenge of it and didn't even necessarily mean that I bought any of that stuff, but just the creative outlet of doing that. And now I want someone to give us a show where we challenge people to do things like that. How do we make that happen? We can co-host it. It's going to be great. Oh, that I would watch this show. <laughs> that would be super fun. That would be really yeah. fun. Yes. Yeah. Um, like take people to like different flea markets or yard sales or clothing swaps right. or thrift stores and be like, you know, because I think it's always like, oh, all the good stuff is taken. There's no good stuff right. out there. If I really want to have unique style or, or feel good about what I'm wearing, I have to just go on like a fast fashion hall bender right. and that that's just that's just not true i mean you and i know that people who are in this know that like we probably laugh when we hear things like that but unfortunately much like there are plenty of people out there who think amazon is like a great company on the up and up there are also a lot of people out there who think like if you want to look good you have to buy brand new right. clothes that's it i okay let's develop the show i just had even more i, I developed it out a little bit while you were talking so what if it was like <laughs> They're like, it's two people. It could be us or we could get two other people. We could switch who they are, who are, whatever. So we have two people go to like one place and they have like an hour to put together like an amazing outfit. They each do. And then okay. it's sort of like a little contest. And I know contests can be like, not like one's always better, but that will give it that little edge. And then we could just explain like what's so great about both of them. So they could both be winners in a way, but I don't know. Cause I think I love this. Cause I think sometimes people think like, oh, well just that person has like such a good eye and I couldn't do it. I'm like, no, yes, you can. You can. I think people mm -hmm. are so used to being told rules and stuff. Did you ever watch that? Um, what not to wear show? Oh my God. I was just about to ask you, have you ever watched that show? Oh. Because that show sort of like dis was the, the polar opposite of what we're talking about, right? Because yeah. it would be like, we're going to come into your house and we're going to go throw everything away because everything you're right. doing is wrong. Right. You don't you don't have the right instinct or eye for this. And they're going to replace it right. with what is, quote, right. right. And you're going to look like every single other person we've ever had on right. the show. I know. But I have to say, I like, there was a point where I was like obsessed with that. I was like watching reruns and it was... I was fat because I was fascinated with like what they would do, even though I completely agree, like their rules and stuff. And by the way, Stacey London, who seems like a really amazing person on Instagram, who was one of the hosts now, like completely disavows it. And she, like, I think that being on that show almost traumatized her, like the way they did that to people. Uh, like I, she's like my dream guest because I would love to talk to her about that show because for some of us, that was like a really formative form of media for right. us, you know? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I th I, you should contact her. I think she would do it. She seems very she open. Should. Yeah, she's she's uh -huh. really quirky now. Like her style's like so <laughs> not at all like how it looked then. Um, yeah, she seems really cool. Like she's someone you'd want to be friends with. Is how I feel about her. I think so too. Yeah, and I think she's had. Um, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure like she had depression. And she's super open about it. She had some mental health issues, and she's really open. And I think people who do that are like you know really brave as well. I think so too, because you, like, once again, like I see people who are being open about their mental health and I'm like, thank you. Mm -hmm. But there are plenty of people out there who are like, what are you like a snowflake right. a week right. or whatever? Yeah. Or like, why are you talking about this? I want to hear about why I need to throw out all my socks and get new ones. Right. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I do think like, I, I love the idea of like, cause I'm constantly thinking like, how do we show people, Right. you know, like it's one thing to tell people. That only goes so far. Showing is is what's next. Like, what are the images? What what is the roadmap that we show everyone? And they're like, oh wow, you're right. Like, I could, I could not buy anything brand new for a year and look amazing and exactly. be my best self and feel happy. I think there's a lot of concern that uh, 
if you want to care about the planet and its people, then you have to make tremendous sacrifices to your happiness and sense of well-being. And that's just not true. No, it isn't. And um, there's a girl, I'm going to have to look up her name, but she just started an online, I think she can be in person too, she's based in New York, but um, st- she's like a stylist, but she will help style what is already in your closet. And I think that's a great yeah. idea of a service too. Like, because so much of people shopping for new things is they want, it's to try to, you know, fill an emptiness or get some sort of feeling. Like I'm, I'm not a psychologist, so I can't tell people why they're, you know, why they shop. But we know this, we know this instinctively. Like that's yeah, why yeah. Th- there's, there's a thing of like, I, if I get this new thing, it will make me feel better, even if it's just temporary. Um, but she does a whole thing where she'll go through your closet and help restyle it in different ways. And I'm like, that should, that should be a high school class. That should be part of Hallmack. Like, I mean, like seriously, you know, I think, <laughs> but that's a great bit. Like when I heard about her business and then she's going to get other people to work with her, it's like, there's part of me that's like, Oh, let me just drop everything and go do that. That could be cool. But I'm like, okay, focus. That's, not, that's not your focus. <laughs> And then Amanda and I are going to do this reality show where people go in the thrift stores and they, but I know I can't wait. Like, like I hope that like there's a producer listening to this right now and we're going to go make this show because I have, I'm, I'm, my brain is moving 10 miles, 10,000 miles an hour right now with ideas for it. Yeah. <laughs> but that, I mean, cause that's part of, I mean, that's why people like love Project Runway in a way, but that was, you know, they were actually making, but we love to see the creative process, but we need to bring people into the creative process. And that's also part of that thing we were talking about, I think like before with the right to repair thing is people need to, to know that it's okay to like, I don't know, play dress up and and do things themselves Mm -hmm. and put things together. Mm -hmm. And I do think like with Depop, some younger, like, you know, teens and 20 somethings, there, there are some that kind of do that, but I still think there's way too many who, yeah, they just look like, to fast fashion to mm-hmm. to dress them and that you know and then it's done but um yeah yeah no i'm really excited about the show we can get all of our different friends who are stylists to like mm-hmm. make guest appearances where we're like in the space helping like you know helping the people pick their outfits exactly anyway it's gonna be sort of like kitchen um master chef but for outfits there you go exactly for sec- out of secondhand outfits okay that's our that's our p- elevator pitch <laughs> I like it. (laughs) If you're enjoying this episode, then this is a great time to remind you that my work here at Close Horse is made possible by the support of listeners like you, just like NPR, and these great small businesses. Please go give them your support. Blank Cass or Blanket Coats by Cass, is focused on restoring, renewing, and reviving the history held within vintage and heirloom textiles. By embodying the love, craft, and energy that is original to each vintage textile as I transfer it into a new garment, I hope we can reteach ourselves to care for and mend what we have and make it last. Blank Cass lives on Instagram at blank underscore Cass, and a website will be launched soon at blankcass.com. Located in Whistler, Canada, Velvet Underground is a velvet jungle full of vintage and secondhand clothing, plants, a vegan cafe, and lots of rad products from other small sustainable businesses. Our mission is to create a brand and community dedicated to promoting self-expression, as well as educating and inspiring a more sustainable and conscious lifestyle, both for the people and the planet. Find us on Instagram at shop underscore velvet underground or online at www.shopvelvetunderground.com. St. Evans is a New York City based vintage shop that is dedicated to bringing you those special pieces you'll reach for again and again. More than just a store, St. Evans is dedicated to sharing the stories and history behind the garments. 10% of all sales are donated to a different charitable organization each month. New Vintage is released every Thursday at wearstevens.com with previews of new pieces and more brought to you on Instagram at where underscore st dot evens. That's where St. Evans. 
Country Feedback is a mom-and-pop record shop in Tarboro, North Carolina. They specialize in used rock, country, and soul, and offer affordable vintage clothing and housewares. Do you have used records you want to sell? Country Feedback wants to buy them. Find us on Instagram at Country Feedback Vintage and Vinyl, or head down east and visit our brick and mortar. All are welcome at this inclusive and family-friendly record shop in the country. Republica Unicornia Yarns, handmade yarn and notions for the color obsessed, made with love and some swearing in fabulous Atlanta, Georgia by head yarn wench Kathleen. Get ready for rainbows with a side of giving a damn. Republica Unicornia is all about making your own magic using small batch, responsibly sourced, hand dyed yarns and thoughtfully made notions. Slow fashion all the way down and discover the joy of creating your very own beautiful hand knit, crocheted or woven pieces. Find us on Instagram at Republica underscore Unicornia underscore yarns and at www.republicaunicornia.com. Picnic Wear, a slow fashion brand ethically made by hand from vintage and dead stock materials, most notably vintage towels. Founder Danny has worked in the industry as a fashion designer for over 10 years, but started Picnic Wear in response to her dissatisfaction with the industry's shortcomings. Picnic Wear recently moved to rural North Carolina, where all their sewing and accessories are now designed and cut, but the majority of their sewing is done by skilled garment workers in New York City. Their customers take comfort in knowing that all their sewists are paid well above New York City minimum wage. Picnic Wear offers minimal waste and maximum authenticity. Future vintage over future garbage. Cute Little Ruin is an online shop dedicated to providing quality vintage and secondhand clothing, vinyl, and home items in a wide range of styles and price points. If it's ethical and legal, we try to find a home for it. Vintage style with progressive values. Find us on Instagram at Cute Little Ruin. The Pewter Thimble is a curated secondhand shop based out of Rome, Italy. Owner Desiree Marie Townley has a background in costuming and makeup for dance and opera and focuses on dressing for the character you want to be in the world. Curated collections are dropped in a story sale and always have a specialized theme like the color palette of Starry Night, the film classic Casablanca, and the children's novel The Secret Garden. Desiree works with local artisans, and pieces are rescued from markets and rehabilitated and resold with worldwide shipping. The Pewter Thimble is a collection of pieces that will have eternal style from the eternal city. Discover more on Instagram at The Pewter Thimble. Okay, well, in addition to this new show that is coming that, you know, someday that we just invented. Uh, I know that there are other things that you are excited about in the world of sustainable fashion. And I think it's important for us to talk about those because it's not all just like despair yes. right now. No, no, it's not. Um, yeah, I think, well, first of all, just in general, I think there's a lot of, I don't want to say younger designers, but smaller designers, not younger, but smaller, who are becoming more, and I, I pause because the word sustainable is so overused. Ugh, I know every time I use it, I feel dirty. Uh, Vanessa Friedman, who writes for fashion for the New York Times, has changed her language to responsible fashion, which responsible feels a little clunky and like not exciting too. So I don't, that's not quite it either, but because it's important to have the ethics in there and because sustainable has been so greenwashed, I'm just going to say responsible, but there's more. <laughs> For now, until I <laughs> all the it good out. words get ruined. I know yeah. we, we need to like find a new word. Um, so that's part of it. But other things I'm excited about are actually biomaterials, which a lot of people don't know about. Um, but for example, a while back we interviewed a young textile designer from Vietnam who's named Chloe Tran, and she's she went to Parsons here, I think, for textiles. But she started a company called Tom Tex. And Tom, and I'm, I'm probably pronouncing that quite right, but it means shrimp in Vietnamese and tax for textiles. And she creates a leather-like material from a combination of coffee grounds and shell seafood waste, like shrimp, like shrimp rinds, wow. if you will. Wow. Which, I mean, this makes sense to me. Like, it, it's, it sounds crazy. And what's cool is 
she was inspired um, to do that because she lives in Vietnam where so many like of our secondhand clothing goes. And so she saw all this clothing waste like in her, literally like in her backyard. I mean, I mean not, okay, maybe not her backyard, but you know, around, like in mm-hmm. the world in a way that is hidden from us. And so she experimented in this. And just this past New York Fashion Week, um, this designer, Peter Doe, who's also Vietnamese, collaborated with her and he, he created clothes and put them on his runway that like look like these gorgeous leather pants and shirts and they are made from this material. And it's exciting to me on like so many levels because first of all, okay, you don't have um, like the killing of animals and, and the, also a lot of um, leather, the way that they prepare, you know, prepare the skins to be you know, used leather is highly toxic and, and bad for the environment. Um, but also this will then like biodegrade um, naturally and won't poison the earth after the fact. So there's so many things one has to think about. Um, and, but I remember her saying that the challenge is making the public know about these options. So like, then we can ask, ask companies, hey, are you using this or that? Otherwise, like big brands aren't necessarily gonna have the incentive to invest in this. Um, but that's one I find really exciting. And mycelium based leather is also gaining traction. That's what Stella McCartney is using for some of her, you know, leather bags. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And Hermes is going to use now Hermes. So I can feel the eyes rolling. So, you know, they make insanely, <laughs> <laughs> I can feel it. Um, but if you get the big companies on board, it, it will trickle down to, you know, other companies using it. Um, that this I do believe, but you know, so mycelium is, is based on the fungi that creates mushrooms and it's just, it's so actually good for the environment. And so again, at the end of life, it's going to just, you know, biodegrade and it's not going to be in a landfill. So I'm super excited about those. I'm excited about the repair movement. Um, I, Mm -hmm. I do think that's happening. Um, I'm excited about the fiber shed movement, which is actually international. It started in California where uh, Rebecca Burgess, who started it, I think she just wanted to see if she could get clothes locally made in the most radical way. Like literally, like first have like the sheep shorn that creates the wool, like literally from like whatever they come from, from the cotton, from the sheep into like clothes. And she ended up having, and I'll be honest, it was a little too beige and, Oh, oh, natural. <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't have to it be. Doesn't it doesn't have, have to, to be. be. But yeah. what it's doing is what's really cool. It's created this this movement really across the world. But I know they have a fiber shed in Connecticut. I think they have one in New York, California, elsewhere, where it's this community that is, first of all, um, it's helping the farmers get money for the wool from their sheep because a lot of them, they have just meat-based sheep. And I'm not going to get into like... Uh, I mean, I tend to be vegetarian, but I'm not going to get into animal rights things here so much. But mm-hmm. no, th- but the sheep in these places, at least the way they're shorn and the way the wool is gotten off them is completely ethical. So there's no you know, pain to the sheep on that. Um, but a lot of the meat-based farmers, like the wool is like, they don't get any money for that. So if wool could actually start to have more value, then we might not have as many like meat-based sheep or there'll be another, you know, opportunity for that. Um, but it, so it's creating sort of like these whole ecosystems of makers from like the farm all the way through the fashion in these communities. Um, so, you know, so there's the knitters, the weavers, it, it's cool. I think it's really, it's like the slow fashion economic system. Um, and it also helps, you know, with climate change because you're not shipping things the way, you know, the farms are all like organic and, you know, and good. And also, they also work a lot with various indigenous um, cultures. They've, they've become really, you know, so it, it's not just like, again, like the privileged white people, but, you know, mm-hmm. looking at, you know, communities that are already here, that are already doing things, say, hey, how can we work with you? How can we provide you some income by buying these things from you and then creating these things? Um, so I'm, I'm excited about that happening. Uh, and yes, and I hope like the fashion it's a little more fashion with a capital F, but yes, I think that that can definitely happen. 
<laughs> I think so too. Uh, I feel like thinking back, you know, to say even just 2020, I've seen so many leaps forward in the past few years in both, you know, emerging technology here, but also just the level of knowledge that people are gaining as a whole about all of this. Mm -hmm. And like, that's, that really is, you know, someone told me at work last week, I think they were being a little trolly and ages towards me, but they, I, they said, saying that knowledge is power is such a boomer thing to say. And I was like, wow, I actually don't feel that way at all. Also, I'm not a boomer, right. but no shame if I were. <laughs> um, but I, I like, I think that understanding, knowing these things is step one to large scale change. And that's why it's important for us to continually be sharing the knowledge and experience that we have with other people so that they can spread it to the people exactly. around them. Exactly, 100, you know? 100%. And following up on that, it's super important too, because like you were saying, you know, those sustainable brands, those initial ones were like these big companies saying what things were, you know, we have to remember that, that, change that happens isn't inevitable in that like, you know, we talk about, um, for example, like technology is often like, oh, well, that's just inevitable that, you know, there's going to be more surveillance because there's the internet. It's like that. It's like, no, no, that's a choice. It's a choice of choosing to give up mm -hmm. rights. It's a choice. So we can have choices. So again, just like, oh, it's, it's inevitable. Amazon's going to take over the world. No, no, it's not like you, but you have to be shown the other options. And as long as like, you know, the power structure of our country is kind of, you know, anti showing the other options other than hyper capitalism, not to get too like geeky here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we have to be able to show and it can be something as simple as like, hey, come on our really cool show about, you know, and style your thing in thrift store. It could be that. <laughs> or, Wait, did anybody offer us offer a deal for this show yet? I know, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, on, on No Kill, we have three days, three ways, which any, you know, anyone listening, if you have something you want to show how you style it three different ways, you know, you know, DM me and, you know, we'd be happy to have you. But it's like that. It's like, hey, look, it, there, there's these alternatives. There's other ways to do it. It's not a foregone conclusion that, you know, you to look cute, you have to buy fast fashion that costs $5. I, I mean, no. It doesn't have to be that way. Don't, don't, don't like sell yourself short. Don't think like, you know, because some powers that be are marketing it to you like that. Um, that's the only way. So, so, and we're here to help. <laughs> we are here to help. And you know, I, I get it. There are days where I feel like, uh, I'm just this grain of sand in this humongous desert. Like, what can I do? But I also have to take a step back and think like, actually, you know, fast fashion wouldn't be this huge behemoth. Amazon wouldn't be driving out every small business that remains, et cetera, et cetera, if we hadn't been giving them our money in the first place. Right. That we actually, if you're like, I don't have time to call my elected officials or register people to vote or, I don't know, teach other people how to mend, whatever, if you're like, I'm barely just getting by with my existence every day and the amount of time that I'm given, that's fine. But recognize that one easy thing you can do is just not shop with those places anymore because they, at the end of the day, I think we start to think of like Amazon or Shein or even Forever 21 as these like entities, right. but really uh, they are businesses that rely on our money to keep going. Right. Exactly. And if we stop shopping there, like they will go away. You know, I would, I would read a lot of in the early aughts, like really hand wringing pieces about how Walmart was just destroying like the main street in every small town by like shutting down small businesses, which is true, right. right? That is exactly what was happening. But I think that there was this implication that it was solely Walmart that was at fault there. And I'm sorry to say this, this is going to hurt some feelings. It was also the fault of the consumers who decided they wanted to go buy everything at, at Walmart right. exactly. and not support their local businesses. And maybe they didn't realize that that's how things would play out. But now we've seen this play out enough times to know that that's that's how it, that's how it ends. Right. Right. And so we all do have so much power to change the world. And we just we just can't give up. And we need to be there to remind the others around us that they do, too, that they're an important piece of this puzzle. Right. Exactly. Um, 
and slightly off topic, but actually on topic. Um, I just finished reading A Visible Man by Edward Enninful. I don't know. Mm-hmm. And he's the editor of British Vogue. And I have to say that I found it so inspiring, just his journey. And he he's a gay black male. So the idea that he would become the editor of British Vogue was like wild. Wild. Amazing. Exactly. Yeah. But, you know, his whole mission, uh, similar like our mission, sort of like sustainable fashion and responsible fashion, his whole mission is like diversity and inclusivity. And the things he's done, and honestly, I didn't know this till I read this book because I don't subscribe to British Vogue. I, I haven't paid much attention, but I, you know, I kind of had this vague notion about it. Um, like he put uh, frontline COVID workers on the cover one one issue, which was like huge because the cover of the magazine brings so much money to the magazine. And so basically he's like, no, we're not taking the money. We are honoring these people, like just regular people, like nurse and whatever. And, um, and he's done some other really radical things of inclusion and putting, you know, many more people of color on the cover or inside. And I just found like how he was talking about it. And like, when you have these, you know, a platform and obviously our platforms aren't quite as big as British folk, but when you have your platform <laughs> where you can share things, it's so important because that is the way change can happen. Like if mm-hmm. we, if we make it normal that, you know, you know, black women are on the cover of magazines, like you and I probably go, well, isn't that normal? But statistically it's actually still not, um, that that's going to change, you know, identities and how people, what people think they can do. And same thing if like, we make it normal that like you know thrifting is cool or guess what maybe you have to save some money to buy a coat because it's going to cost more but it's going to last longer you know um yeah i think yeah i think that is a big part of it it's it, that constant education and that constant normalizing um something that's not considered the norm because trust me if he hadn't become the the editor of British Vogue, it would have stayed in the same, like, very stodgy upper middle class above that, like, white women, in, you know, in England, you know, because that was, it's yeah. a no. Yeah. And, you know, everybody has a platform. You know, I was, I was talking to someone on Friday night about social media, right? And how there, you know, there are plenty of bad things about social media. I mean, like, people buy a ton of stuff just because they see it on social media. Right. But people see things on social media and it makes impact on them, whether it is to go buy this new outfit or if it is to, you know, recycle, reuse their jars. Like it, it's just that easy that like you might be like, I only have a thousand followers. I only have 200 followers. I'm not even on social media. I just know some people in real life. That is your platform. Mm-hmm. And that is how we normalize these things. Like the, a, a new course for our planet and making this a healthy, safe, happy place for future generations is going to involve change from all of us like yes it's going to mean that like big sweeping corporate change is going to have to happen there is certainly going to be need to be a ton a total shift in how our laws around environmental and worker protections work right now Um, there's going to be a lot of new research and technology involved of course but also there will be large societal changes where all of us are changing how we live to our day-to-day life Mm -hmm. And it starts now and it starts with us normalizing new things. I mean, even just as simple as like normalizing, taking the bus or riding a bike versus like driving everywhere. I mean, that's like old school at this point, right? Like we all know that one, but I'll tell you (laughs) what I think is like normalizing composting. Like I look seriously, it's intimidating to people. I know. Show them it's not. I mean, I live in Brooklyn in an apartment, like, and what we use is we use our milk cartons and we put like everything in the milk cartons and then on Saturdays there's somewhere right by our house or there's also a community garden but honestly we've just started doing it regularly like in the past year and it's like and I try to get my relatives who live like in the midwest and they have all the space in the world to do it and they're like Uh, like (laughs) I'm like we we use so many less garbage bags now because of it oh my gosh I know no same for me I mean I've been lucky in that well 
when I lived in Portland, we had composting there, which was great, like a compost can that got picked up every week. In Philadelphia, we did not have that. And so we had to like hire a service to do it. Um, then we moved out to the country where we were le- where j- legit. We're like, here's our huge ass composting can out in the backyard that I literally used in our garden. Um, also, compost is like both gross and fascinating mm-hmm. to when you're doing it yourself. It's like and it, it I trust me, I read a lot of books about composting like a year ago um and now we now that we're living in a city again in austin we like our city picks up compost but like when we moved to philly and we didn't have access to compost initially the amount of trash bags we were going through and we're not like big food wasters but it just adds up right it's like coffee grounds number one right or like I always save all of our food scraps and use it to make vegetable broth, which then I use in all of our cooking. But like after you cook the broth, you still have like this like primordial right. ooze of vegetable scraps, right? That was another thing that would be like half a trash bag, you know? So I also composting can save you money. I think composting is a great thing to normalize because people are freaked out by it because it's trash, yeah. right? Yeah. It's scary. I mean, that's one way that you as an individual can make an impact is by showing people how you compost no or yeah. how you repaired things or how you removed a stain or how you stained your favorite dress but then just dyed it green and now it's a new dress right like there there are all these things that people aren't thinking of or they are thinking they can't do that they don't have the power or skills to do right. and you can show them that they can do it yeah totally um i i've gotten so funny lately that like I'm just like out on the street and I like eat a banana. I'm like, okay, I have to wait till I'm like by a park or bush something so I can throw my banana peel under it so it just degrades naturally. <laughs> so it's not, I cannot put my banana peel in the garbage. And like, I, you know, I grew up going like, oh, that's gross when people just leave their banana peel not in the garbage. But <laughs> I'm like, I've completely like flipped. Um, I don't know if what I'm doing is better, but it's what I do. Yeah, yeah. I you know I actually I, the banana is is the struggle is real. I recently had that on when we were at the, we were in Mexico City a few weeks ago, and I was eating a banana, and I was like, okay, do I need to carry this peel around all day, or should I should we go to a park just so I can put it in the bushes? And I was like, Amanda, in the future, you need to th- eat bananas only near things right. where it can be. <laughs> <laughs> See? Uh, yeah, welcome to our lives. See, we just normalized it. It's okay to, if you two are fretting about banana peels or apple cores or whatever else it is that you are eating. I, I get it. Um, yeah, but it all starts with us, you know? And I think I, when I hear people saying like, oh, one person can't make a difference, so I'm just going to give up. I mean, like I get comments on that on Instagram constantly. They're like, I get what you're saying, but one person can't make a difference. And I'm like, wow, you haven't like been reading anything I've been posting. Wow. But also I get that feeling because I feel that way sometimes too. And then I, someone will send me a message and say like, you know, I thrifted my entire Halloween costume this year because of something you said, or I took a sewing class so I could repair my clothes because of this one episode you did about sewing. And like, those are that I'm just one person, right. you know? Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, the way I look at this is, um, I don't know why, but I, I always have this vision in my head, like a, a bowl full of sand and a bowl with nothing. And every day I just put like one little grain of sand in the other bowl. I love that. And yeah. I, I don't know where I came up with that or why I decided that, but it, I just, I just have to have faith that like, eventually this is all going to go over to here and that it does make a change. Um, cause you're putting energy I, out. I like that. Yeah. 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 Someone uh, shared a different metaphor with me the other day, which is a lot grosser, which was like, how do you eat an elephant? And it's like one bite at a time. And I was like, okay, well, is there like a vegan version of that? And <laughs> I you just said it. So right. thank you. Because we do love our <laughs> elephants. But, um... We do. I know. I was like, why do you have to pick an elephant? Right. Can you said like a T-Rex, something that doesn't exist right, anymore? Exactly. And it would have been like, because I was like, I feel sad. I don't want to eat this yeah. elephant. I guess I'm giving up. Right. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it, it, you know, it, it just, it's not going to happen overnight, but it's also never going to happen if you just give up. Exactly. And, and like we were saying, there are so many, like, once you start to kind of like look for like the sustain, sustainable options, it, it's fun. I think it's fun. And people can go to No Kill for shopping tips. Um, there you go. I mean, we made shopping guides. I mean, sometimes I'm like, oh my God, do we have to tell people where to buy things? And then I'm like, oh, Katja, stop being such a snot and just like. I mean, that one is hard for me, right? Because I I want to turn the narrative away from shopping. Right. But we're just not there right. yet. Right. And it's a, it's people's gateway to me. Like, yeah, it is. Like, 
if, if they don't know anything about like sustainable fashions, like the first thing they want to know is what can they buy? And, and it's, if you say to them, no, 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 don't, don't think that way. They're, I think they're going to turn off right away. They're going to be like, oh, crazy hippie freak or something. I don't know. You know, they'll be like, you're just not even on my planet if, if shopping isn't part of my solution. Um, so yeah, it's funny. Cause I, I get tired of like going like, should we, should we add another article like about, you know, shopping, you know, for new jackets or something, because then you have to update them. I, I try to do it just more like these, these are the best stores for this. These are the best stores for that. But, um, yeah, I, I think shopping still an important thing, at least in, in the U S. Um, I, I interviewed Ursula de Castro and uh, like, I don't know when this was probably like six months ago or so. And I was talking to her and I was saying how like with no kill, we try to like meet people where they are and we try to make it sort of like a fashion, you know, a fashion magazine that just happens to be sustainable. And she was like, Oh no, I think people are like beyond that. I think people already know that. And I really wanted to be like, mm, maybe in London, but not, not here. here. Yeah. I, I'm not here. Con- I know. I think cause our country's so big that things can be hidden. Like landfills <laughs> I know that like yeah I mean the UK is relatively small I mean compared to here so like I think things like waste things like you know dwindling resources they see in a way that when you have like huge mountains and prairies and stuff you, you, you don't see in suburbs <laughs> really big suburbs <laughs> yeah yeah no it's true it's true I I think here I mean, I, I just also think, like, information travels more slowly here. Mm-hmm. Like, there's just so many people. Right. And so many places and so many different networks of people. Because um, I do I do get feedback like that sometimes, too. Like, I think you're really pointing out the obvious here. And it's always someone who's not from the United States <laughs> or has lived in the big city their entire life and doesn't know. Like, whereas I can tell you, like, it was revelatory for my stepmom and dad that uh most clothes had polyester in them right you know exactly <laughs> so, <No. laughs> yeah i mean like it, it, it's true and i think that like uh, there all of us even people who are listening to us probably have knowledge wisdom if you will that you have acquired through your own journey in life that many people around you do not know right. and it's great to share it and i think that you know we're often discouraged from doing that especially if we are women or non-binary uh or just like you know not white cis dudes Mm -hmm. right and i think like you know we're we're not supposed to be smart i know that because i was told that in like eighth grade that boys would like me if i stopped being so smart which is like why right Right? (laughs) why i don't want to live in that world but uh, i definitely took that advice to heart for a really long time and i'm going to tell you all get out there and be loud about the stuff you know because people want to hear it definitely and and we do have platforms you're right we all have platforms where we can we share all have it. platforms we all matter yeah in this yeah well this was so delightful i had such a fun time Thank you. uh do you have any like final parting words or oh my i don't know anything you want to share if you don't it's okay too i mean that's like a really difficult question i mean i, th- I think just basically what you said I mean we're all well we're all part of it and I think especially as you know women or or non-straight white dudes to (laughs) to really acknowledge and embrace our worth and our knowledge I feel like that's been an ongoing journey for me in my life to be like I'm worthy uh, or what I what I have to say is worthwhile and worth people listening to. Cause I think we are taught to shut down and we are taught to discount ourselves. And I think it's really important. And if you actually look, you know, women are at the forefront of the climate movement and I were at the forefront of the fashion, sustainable fashion movement. And I think it's important for us to push forward because there's plenty of people who would like to shut us down, but we're not going to let yeah. it happen. So, um, we're not going to let it happen. And, yeah. and it's fun. And it can be fun. And it can be uh, exciting. It can be a community. So it's not just beige and green. It's hot pink, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And patterns, mixed patterns, mm-hmm. whatever. Are you cottagecore? Are you, I don't know, like futuristic? Are you goth? We have, we have, come join us. Exactly. You're part of this. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Mm-hmm. 
Thanks again to Katya for being such an amazing guest. I could have talked to her for about 100 more hours. And we're already talking about ways we can work on other projects in the future because we just had such a great time working together. If you know anyone who wants to produce our thrifting challenge reality show, which I can't stop thinking about, please drop me a line. I am super serious. <laughs> I'm a little nervous about being on camera, but... I love the idea of this program. In the meantime, go follow at No Kill Mag on Instagram and check out all of the amazing and inspiring content Katia and her team are creating at nokillmag.com. To repeat what Katia said earlier in our conversation that has just been sticking with me since we talked, the future is a place we invent. Change is a choice. And we all, all of us, we have a place in making that change. I know, I know that it feels so overwhelming sometimes. Yes, even I wake up some days and I just wonder, should I just give up and become one of those target influencers or something? Because it's a lot. Caring is a lot, right? Something I have found is that once you know what is right and what is important, It's like a seed that plants in your brain and it just grows and grows. You can't turn it off. You can't ignore it. And it begins to show itself in the decisions you make in every aspect of your life. Even though sometimes it is so frustrating or even, I don't know, like exhausting, you know that you'll never be happy if you just give up. Because the seed and its resulting bloom is part of you now. That's where I am. I'm glad that seed found its way into my brain. And by now, it's it's a full-on tree that gives me both motivation and strength. The work I do here and in my own private life nourishes both that tree and me. It gives me the energy to educate others, to stand up to internet trolls, to work to find the better way to do things. I hope, no, I know that you will find yourself feeling the same way, and and maybe you already are. We all have a place in this, and I'm glad you're all here. Thanks for listening to another episode of Close Horse, written, researched, edited, all the things by me, Amanda Lee McCarty. If you would like to support my work here on Close Horse, you can learn more at patreon.com slash close horse podcast. And if you like what you're hearing here, you know, leave a rating and or a review on Apple Podcasts or just tell your friends because that's that's the most important thing is getting more people involved, right? Thanks, as always, to my other half, Dustin Travis White, for our music and audio support. And I'll see you all next week. Bye.